Their roots in the U.S. go back more than a century. Their ties to family and tradition know no borders. Meet the Ukrainian Americans. Proud of their heritage, happy to share, they're equally proud to be part of the American way of life. Catch a thread of their story and a whole lot more this time on World in America. line which was made quite famous in the 19th century by a great Ukrainian poet, Taras Shevchenko. And what he said to his countrymen, uh, he faced a lot of opposition by the, the Russian empire. He was exiled for writing in Ukrainian, things like that. But what he said to us was, Learn the ways of other people. Do not forsake your own. No matter their background, many Ukrainian Americans seem to hold one thing in common, a combined spirit of openness and love for their culture. On this edition of World in America, we'll explore a bit of that culture. With music and dance, we'll witness a living connection to the past. We'll discover the beauty and refinement of unique forms of art and enjoy the kind of cooking, some say, you can only get at home. We'll also join a number of Ukrainian Americans as they share some of their deeper experiences and stories. His Eminence, Archbishop Anthony, leads the Eastern Eparchy of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in America. His years of religious service has kept him in touch with generations of Ukrainian Americans. He offers this introduction to the community. Ukrainian Americans are uh... The, uh, a group of people who came from an area of, of Eastern Europe uh, on its, uh, the bound border country, that's precisely what Ukraine means, the border country between the Soviet, the Russia and uh, the rest of Europe. Located between Russia and Poland, Belarus and Romania, today's Ukraine is a country growing in prosperity with the second largest territory in Europe. Its history is no less varied or complex. Archbishop Anthony explains the difficult times in Ukraine's past that led to his community's beginning. There are primarily four ways of immigration, immigration to the United States of, of Ukrainians. The first was in the, the late part of the, the uh, 19th century. The next period of migration happened around World War I. This time, says Archbishop Anthony, Ukrainians came to the U.S. for both political and economic reasons. The Russian Revolution of 1917, subsequent strife, and a massive famine in the 1920s led thousands to leave the country. Many of those who settled in America went back to work in the coal mines of Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Others manned the steel mills of Ohio and Detroit. The third wave came immediately after World War II. And this was almost purely a political uh, immigration. Uh, with, they were what were called the displaced persons who had fled Ukraine uh, when uh, the Nazis came into Ukraine and took over, uh, took, it took over basically the entire country uh, until 1939 to 44. The last and largest wave to the U.S. began fairly recently, in 1991. Ukraine declared its independence. As in other former Soviet republics, the rough transition to a market economy left many on tough times. Ukraine as a young country was not able to provide these young people. And most of them were Ukrainian intelligentsia who, who came uh, uh, because they couldn't find work. And of course that has changed dramatically in Ukraine now. Today, between one and two million people of Ukrainian descent live in the U.S., largely in the Northeast, Midwest, and California. Most are citizens. Some are newly arrived immigrants. Over the years, 
they've seen their share of challenges and success. Archbishop Anthony explains what the community has come to enjoy the most about living in America. The first, second, and third waves like the fact that they have finally fit in and that they have members of Congress, they have uh, professors in college, they have heads of medical schools, they have uh, people high up in the armed forces in command uh, po positions. That whole concept of the big brother is watching uh, back in the Soviet times, in the communist times, was a, a completely frustrating way of life. You just, uh, there was the freedom to just be yourself, I think is something that's just incredibly powerful for all of them. It's called the Hopak. And if you had to pick one dance that would symbolize the national dance of Ukraine, it would be this dance. My name is uh, Volodymyr Sizanenko, Walter Sizanenko, and um, I uh, was born in the United States in Philadelphia. My name is Katerina Sizanenko, Katerina Sizanenko. I was born here in New Jersey. My parents came to the United States as uh, teenagers uh, right after World War II. Hello, my name is Alexander Sizanenko, or my name is Alexander Sizanenko. have a lot of people and the boys are showing off with kicks and jumps and the girls are doing a lot of spins. Dance is a great way to keep them interested and connected to their culture and their heritage. My name is Christine Sizanenko. I'm an American of Ukrainian descent, born in this country. The Sizanenko family, Walter, Christine, and their children represent the latest branch in a Ukrainian-American family stretching back decades. Residents of Randolph, New Jersey, they were all born and raised in the U.S. Walter Sizanenko tells of his family's beginnings. My uh, roots on, on both my parents' side, uh, my mother and my father's side, started in Ukraine. And they were um, taken by the, uh, the Nazis during World War II, so they were taken to labor camps. Um, they they uh, uh, spent quite a few years in the labor camps in Germany. Um, at the end of the World War, the uh, uh, American soldiers allowed them to uh, be sponsored by, by families here in the United States. Both my parents finished high school and, uh, and went to, on to college here, and they met here in the United States. So they, they were born there, they came over as teenagers, and they met here. Like many Ukrainian Americans, both Mr. and Mrs. Sizanenko grew up with strong ties to their culture. They speak of a love of language and tradition inherited from their parents, something they continue to pass on to the next generation. Mostly by our parents always having us learn about Ukrainian things and never letting us forget that that is where we are from. There was a, uh, a very strong feeling of the traditions. And uh, so that, that was part of the identity, I think, that uh, my family and I have is, is part of that uh, tradition. The cuisine, good part of that, the, the food, there's U Ukrainian food that you know about. Uh, music is a big part of the culture. Uh, there's there's uh, various types of music, um, uh, so that's a big part of it. The embroidery, um, uh, from, a, from an artistic perspective, uh, uh, Ukrainian Easter eggs are certainly a part of that. The writing of Easter eggs, or pisanki, is just one of the many traditions families like the Sizanenkos proudly keep alive. I would like to share with you some of my collection of Ukrainian Easter eggs, or pisanki. And the way these eggs are made is by writing on the egg with wax. It's a process called wax resist dyeing. You cover the part of the egg that's going to stay a certain color, and then you dye it into a different color. This egg has white, yellow, red, and black. Most of these eggs were done by me. A few of them were gifts from other people. This egg is a goose egg. There was a woman in my church choir who knew that I wrote eggs, and she had a farm, and she would occasionally bring me some goose eggs. This one probably took 
somewhere between 20 and 30 hours of labor. It's a, an intricate design with a lot of colors. Equally symbolic and important to their culture is the art of Ukrainian embroidery. Done by hand, the intricate patterns are usually passed down from mother to daughter. From her class in Lower Manhattan, Lubo Walinets teaches anyone who'd like to learn. She's especially happy to share the meanings behind this ageless form of stitching. Vishavata really comes from shete, which is sewing, but Vishavata is it's more than sewing. It's embellishing sewing. Um, embroidery, again, was began as, as um, stitchery applied to different parts of clothing as protective uh, element. It's a highly stylized art. They don't depict nature as it is. They stylize, like for example, all of these motifs are the tree of life motif. You have all of these motifs, that they are signs of the sun. And the sun was very important for an agrarian society, especially in the spring. And so they tried to embroider this, keep it under cloth, under clothing, in, to ensure the um, spring rebirth of the sun so that they would warm, warm up the earth. Lines like these are called eternity lines. And this again was important because people wanted life on earth to, to be exist forever. These items here, these they are all, all were created by people in the Carpathian Mountains. There's a very colorful, lively uh, type of people and they loved a lot of color, just like the nature surrounding them. This sign is the, the plowed field. For an agrarian society, it was important in the spring to uh, plow and plant seed in the earth so that it would uh, grow the foodstuffs they needed to survive. And so they repeated this sign in their embroidery also. The specific colors and, and the most popular color was always red. And again, uh, not only because it was bright, but it had a magical uh, significance. It was the color of the sun, color of blood, color of life. And so the more red color in your costume, the more uh, the healthier you will be, the luckier you will be. Tradition says that when you start embroidering any item, you have to clear your mind and your conscience of any bad thoughts, otherwise the embroidery is not going to work. So that's important. And, and I try to explain, and everyone likes this part. Those who come to her class do so at the Ukrainian Museum. Located on East 6th Street in New York, the facility showcases Ukrainian art and opens a door to a culture a thousand years in the making. Ms. Wolinet serves as the museum's curator. She and Ola Hanateko, president of the Board of Trustees, explains its origin and mission. The museum was founded in 1976 by a women's organization called the Ukrainian National Women's League of America. They founded it because they had a collection of folk artifacts from 1933. And by 1976, these items were already deteriorating because they were using them for um, exhibitions, small minor exhibitions, traveling exhibitions. Uh, and in time they saw that uh, quite a few of the items were, were in very, very bad shape. And so the Women's League decided that the only way to preserve this collection and to show it to the Ukrainians as well as to the American citizens of what our cultural background was would be to ex uh, establish a museum. And so this is what they did. So it was a women's organization that founded the museum. Well, for Ukrainian communities, it's a very, very important um, cultural 
edifice since uh, we always have new generations of children and in order for them to appreciate and understand the cultural background of their parents or grandparents visually is the best way of teaching and uh, enjoying it and maybe appreciating it and also maybe uh, developing interest in, in its study. In the process of the 31 years that our existence we have found out that non-Ukrainians are very interested in our folk art exhibitions and in our fine art exhibitions. And the reason I think is because it's educational. When they come to the museum, they learn something about a new culture, a different culture. And that's the contribution that the Ukrainian Museum makes. The restaurant's called Veselka, which means uh, rainbow in Ukrainian. It was started by my father-in-law in 1954. Over the years, our clientele, our market has changed, but we've held on to that basic concept of serving very uh, inexpensive, homemade, simple, good quality Ukrainian foods. First things that come to mind to me are, are borscht, which is a beet soup, which is very traditional in Ukrainian culture. Uh, holopchi, which is a stuffed, which is a stuffed cabbage, which again can have a variety of stuffings traditionally, meat and meat and rice. We make something called nalisniki, which is a which is a, a big crepe that is that is stuffed with with a sweetened farmer cheese and then folded and sauteed in butter, which is also very popular, one of our another one of our big selling items, and kobasa or kielbasa in Polish, which is a garlic, very traditional garlic, flavorful, spicy sausage. Vareniki, which are also known as pierogi, which are which are, which are a dumpling, which can be stuffed with with traditionally several different fillings: potato, cheese, sauerkraut, mushroom, meat. So right now we're watching the uh, ladies make vareniki or pierogies in Polish. Um, this is a very simple dough made of flour, milk, and eggs, which is rolled out, cut in disc. And right now we're making meat pierogies, so we're, they're being stuffed with um, ground meat, which is a mixture of beef, chicken. And in a few seconds after she lays out the um, the stuffing, you have an opportunity to see her actually seal the, seal the dumpling, which is the vast majority of the work. It's very labor intensive. So when I think of Ukrainian cuisine, the, the basic concept of U Ukrainian cuisine, it's Simple, using simple ingredients, hearty, um, delicious, and filling. Smachnoho, enjoy. Beyond language or cuisine, art or music, people of Ukrainian descent claim one more key to their culture. That key, they say, is faith. Among them are followers of many religions. Christianity has long been the most prominent one. For many Ukrainian Americans, the glue of their community and the heart of their identity remains in the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. 
For every one of the waves of immigration, the church was the center of their life. And, and, and I mean every aspect of their life. Their children went to Ukrainian school every Saturday, or sometimes two or three days during the week after they came from day school. Uh, their, and they, were, they participated in the dancing groups, they participated in religious education, they participated in classes to, for the embroidery and the pisanke and every other aspect of Ukrainian culture. So that was the center. This church that, in, in which we are sitting now is, is called St. Andrew's Memorial Church. And it is the, it was built in uh, 19, uh, from 1955 to 65. And it was built in memory of the 10 to 14 million Ukrainians who were starved to death in an artificial famine. The sacrifices and accomplishments of the past have not been lost on today's Ukrainian Americans. Many seek to honor their history by visiting the land of their forebearers. Before 1991, Soviet control of the Ukraine meant few could make the journey. The Sizanenko family describes how their recent trip was one they felt they had to make. Last time actually was the first time for all of us. And so the main motive was our children are getting bigger. We really all want to go together and, and share this experience. And it was kind of now or never. Our son is finishing university. He may get a job. He won't be able to take time off. So it, it was just a good time. It was important for us to, to try to get um, my three children and my wife and I together to go over to, to visit and to expose everyone at the same time. When my, when my parents first said that we were going to go this past summer, I wasn't that excited, but then as it got closer, I got more and more excited because I had learned about all this stuff in Ukrainian school, and then now I would actually be able to see it in person. A lot of times you read about things in history books, and so then we got to see a lot of these places that, you know, for me in Ukrainian school, I had heard about a lot of them. A lot of the famous churches, and we saw graves of famous people, you know, that we had only read about. Visiting the countryside for me was very different because we don't, here we don't live in the city, but we're not in the middle of farms. And there they had, it was, it was just a lot of empty space and all the houses, like the salads, the villages, all the houses were very close together. It was just a different feel for me. Mostly we're in cities, which is not that different. When we visited my husband's grandmother's sister out on a farm, that was very different. When we went to, to visit, we, we flew into the city, actually, into Nipopetrovsk, and then um, uh, parts of the family, uh, my mother's cousins actually came to pick us up and we went out uh, more to the country to visit my, my grandmother's uh, younger sister. And uh, what was just amazing, it was a very small, uh, small house there that she's been forever. I saw the, the house that my grandmother was born in, you know, it was the next house over, so it was very different. Uh, but it's, it was a village, it was a Salah, a, a village. This is, um, you know, family obviously that I, I don't know. I know maybe their names and toward the couple months leading up to our trip I, we made some you know pictures and names and tried to link the two um, but when we got there after the first you know five minutes of greeting and you know um, it was very natural It was a very natural transition when inside the house um, all those pictures that my grandmother had been sending over years and years were, were out out uh, you know in frames um, of, of my kids, of me and my brothers. Um, so it was a very close linkage and it was very strange for me that I, I was a bit embarrassed that I did not know as much about them as they knew about us. I like being able to say that I've been there where my ancestors grew up and my life so much revolves around being Ukrainian and going there was just a wonderful experience. Many Ukrainian Americans say they're proud of their community, its heritage, and what they've achieved. But their greatest contribution might just be their willingness to embrace the best of both worlds. We have, we have raised our generation to be aware of the importance of freedom of independence and of the freedom to love your culture, to express. And this is Indirectly, again, we and our children and our youth 
transfer and add again uh, to, the, to the American community. Every aspect of culture, you'll find you know, Ukrainian Americans who have, who have given their all to that, to that culture. And uh, we want to be able to retain that within this American society. You have a root someplace uh, in Ukraine, through your, yourself or your, your parents, uh, through the church, through the, your, uh, through the ethnic beliefs, and through the traditions. And if you happen to be in America, um, you are not solely American, but you, are, you have this influence of the Ukrainian community, so put them together, you're Ukrainian-American.